Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Friday. We made it through another week. We have an awesome show uh, for you today. You guys know I'm passionate about the issue uh, related to January 6th. Uh, we have political prisoners locked in dungeons over uh, things that I think are blown way out of proportion. And so I'm honored to be joined once again by Nick Searcy. You guys know him as the famous actor. He was in one of my favorite TV shows, Justified, the original Justified, not the second version, uh, Justified, <laughs> that is very woke. And we're joined by uh, Sarah Maccabee. Sarah is the wife of Colton McAvee, who has been locked up uh, for, I believe, now two years over, over January the 6th. And I, I, I want to start here by playing uh, the trailer from Nick Searcy. Nick does documentaries as well, and he did a documentary, Capital Punishment, about what happened on January 6th and the unfair treatment related to the people on January 6th. Nick was there. January the 6th, and he's doing uh, Capital Punishment 2.0 about updating us on what's going on with all the people victimized over the so-called insurrection. Let, let's play the trailer from Capital Punishment before we get into this interview. These are domestic terrorists. The 6th was all deception. The level of sophistication, tactic. People were putting on Trump stuff beforehand or taking it off afterward. Jorge has been an FBI informant for a number of years. On January 6th, I said, are you working? He said, yes. This is treason. They want to criminalize dissent. The FBI, you have a federal search warrant for the property. I opened the shutters that had the battering ram. So I hear, <laughs> then they told me to come out, a whole bunch of red dots all over my chest. They're hunting down Trump supporters. They're like dogs. Well, I just walked into a crowd of people. We just screaming, we just fighting. And now I want you to fight with me. I spent the next three weeks in jail. They put me in a cell by myself, total solitary confinement in a cell not much bigger than a walk-in closet. FBI, guns drawn. Hands up, hands up, hands up. Put your hands on the wall, hands on the wall. This is psychological warfare. It didn't have a battering ram in it, but what it did have was a turret on top. He was pointing his gun at all my neighbors, ready to pull up anytime he needed to. They handcuffed me. They handcuffed you? Yes. Oh! 147 days since my wife was murdered. So I gotta be her voice though. For me, uh, January 6th and the way these guys have been treated is one of the two or three most important issues of uh, this election cycle we're in right now. I, I would love to see all these presidential candidates, particularly on the Republican side, come out and say uh, they're going to pardon everybody involved in January 6th. Uh, and so, Nick, I, I just wanna start with you, and I, I ran into Nick and Sarah last week at an event at John Rich's house. And Sarah, it was a, it's an honor to have met you then, and it's an honor to meet you now. I believe you and your husband are heroes and will go down in history at some point as heroes. But Nick, tell me what's on tap with Capital Punishment 2 and what you're hoping to accomplish with the second documentary. Well, Capital Punishment 2 is more about the aftermath of January 6th and how they are continuing to punish these people and continuing to draw this out in order to affect the next election. That's what it was all about from the beginning. People don't want to believe that January 6th was a complete setup. But the more that we dig into it, the more that we talk to Capitol policemen that were there, the more that we talk to people that saw things that haven't been reported on the news, it becomes more and more apparent that this was all deliberate and that these people were deliberately set up in order to change the, the election, to cover up the fact that there were uh, problems with the 2020 election and this was all done behind the scenes, and I can get into that as much as you want to about like what we've uncovered about that. Well, 
give us a little taste of that in terms of what you've uncovered. And because I do want to get into Colton's case because Colton was a deputy sheriff here in Franklin, Tennessee. Yeah. He's a law enforcement official being treated like a common criminal. But but give us just a little taste of what you've uncovered. Just as, uh, the thumbnail version is that on January 4th, there was intel that they knew that people were coming from, you know, extreme groups that may or may not be violent, Antifa groups and, uh, you know, Oath Keepers or whatever, things that they suspected might turn violent. So on January 4th, President Trump asked for 10,000 National Guard. Nancy Pelosi refused it. Muriel Bowser, the mayor, refused it. And on the day, the Capitol policeman that we talked to, Tarek Johnson, said that he repeatedly called Yogananda Pittman, you're going to hear that name a lot later on, Yogananda Pittman was in charge of the Capitol Police that day, and she did not communicate with her officers the intel that they had, knowing that there was the potential for a huge crowd and possible violence. So the Capitol Police were there, not prepared for any sort of violence whatsoever. And they were understaffed, undermanned, and this was all deliberate because Yogananda Pittman had that information and she never shared it with anyone. And what I believe the reason was, was they wanted January 6th to be even worse than it was. They wanted to have a lot of violence. And I, I don't want to take away from Sarah's time here because it's very important what she has to say. But in a, in a nutshell, that's, that's what Capital Punishment 2 is about. Sarah, walk us through Colton's Okay, what's he been charged with? What are they alleging he did? And, and let's just start there. Yeah, so he's been charged with four felonies and three misdemeanors. On January 6th, he found himself at the Lower West Terrace Tunnel, where a lot of the violence had happened that day. And he was standing outside, and he saw that there was an officer on the ground. So he looked around to the line of duty and said, you have a man down. They didn't do anything. So he went around the barrier, went to go pick up this officer who was laying like a starfish on the ground. Another officer came up to him, hit him across his ribs and his shoulder with a baton, and he just popped up and he said, I'm helping, I'm one of you. At the same time, Roseanne Boylan is laying off to his left as Lila Morris, cap, um, Metropolitan Police Officer, was beating her with over the head with a stick. And he's yelling, stop killing that girl. And he falls down the stairs with the officer because the protesters had a hold Colton of his leg. Colton falls down the stairs. Yes, he fall they slide down the stairs together. And he's over top of him protecting him on his hands and his knees. And you can see on the body camera footage, he's yelling at the protesters around him, stop. You know, they're calling him a traitor. And the officer says, get off of me. And he said, I'm helping you. I'm one of you. And the officer acknowledges it, says, I know, I know. Help me up rolls him over to his side, helps him back up to the line of duty, finds Roseanne Boylan because they had moved her body away. He starts to look through a bag of medical supplies to give her mouth to mouth. When they decided to pick her body back up, go back to the line of duty, he starts to give her chest compressions and he's pulled off of her as they drag her body away. And then after that, the crowd kind of disperses and he's standing there by himself. You can tell he's kind of coming off that adrenaline high. And he's standing there holding his shoulder because his shoulder was broken prior to this in a car accident. And um, an officer, this third officer that he encounters, watched the entire thing go down. It's just all it lasts about seven minutes and says thank you twice for his help that day. And as he's standing there by himself, they're spray spraying him with pepper spray and he yells, I'm not hurting anybody, stop spraying me. The crowd pushes up against him He's in a very defenseless position. This officer that thanked him twice puts his arm around him and says, I got you, man. Calm down. I got you. And then a civilian comes up to get him to go get help for his, his shoulder. In those seven minutes of his life, he's been sitting behind bars for two years awaiting trial on four felonies and three misdemeanors for simply doing what he was trained to do to help people that were in distress. Did he get arrested that day? He did not. He did not get apprehended until August 17th of 21. August, so January, that's six seven, months. eight, six yeah. months later, they come to him. And so it, it would seem like all of this would be on video and on tape, correct? And it is. And, and you've seen it? And I've seen it. And we had his voice extracted from it so you can tell because when he was in his initial bond hearing here in the Middle District of Tennessee, 
they said that they couldn't play the audio because of technical glitches. But regardless of that, the judge in the Middle District of Tennessee said there's no reason to detain this man pending trial. He should be released. The government didn't like that. And so they, um, it got moved to, the, to Washington, D.C., where at that time, Emmett Sullivan, the judge that was presiding over his case, called him a terrorist within five minutes of the hearing, said that he didn't need to hear the audio, that he knew he could tell what was going on. And yet every piece of evidence that they've used against him exonerates him on the charges they have against him. They would not play the audio of the officer saying thank you to Colton. The prosecution in these cases, they deliberately lie. They deliberately change the facts in order to get the conviction. Why do you think they're targeting Colton just for sure? He's a law enforcement official in Tennessee. He seems like an unlikely target. Is it just like they're mad that he was there to support Trump? Yeah, absolutely, because he was a Trump supporter, and it goes against the narrative. I think this is more of a high-profile case because he was a law enforcement officer, but I also think it's because he was trying to save Roseanne Boylan's life, somebody who you're not, you don't really hear that a lot, you don't hear her name a lot, but he was the witness to a murder by the Metropolitan Police officers. And that's part of why they have not brought him to trial up until this time, and they have kept him without setting a trial date because they're afraid for that discovery to come out. They don't want him to testify that he saw the Metropolitan Police beat Roseanne Boylan to death. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And so take a novice like me that's watching this from afar. I know Ashley Babbitt. Roseanne Boylan, she was also killed on this day? There were four people killed on January 6th. Ashley Babbitt was shot by Michael Byrd. And you know about that because it happened on live TV. But Roseanne Boylan walked into the Lower West Terrace Tunnel, never went inside, but walked into the tunnel. There were so many people in there. The police started to spray pepper spray and it sucked all the oxygen up. And so there was a mass exiting for them to get out of the tunnel and into open air. So there were people piling up on top of people and she was at the bottom of the pile. So if you look Roseanne Boylan up, most of the mainstream media will tell you that she she was killed in a stampede. But that is not, she was unconscious while lying there, but she was not dead. And there were other people beaten in that tunnel too. There's a lady named Victoria White who we interview, beaten bloody and then arrested, dragged through the tunnel. And what happened to Roseanne was the police were pushing people out back of the tunnel and there were other forces pushing into the tunnel. So people were crushed and so when Roseanne Boylan, correct me if I'm wrong, but after the mob had been cleared, she was laying on the ground and the police continued to beat her, mm-hmm. continued to strike her. What? What? I mean, I guess the answers are obvious, but I don't understand what, how, and I felt like I've followed this or kind of closely, but I know Ashley Babbitt and, and have been, and so you said four people, including Ashley Babbitt and Rose, two of half the people killed were women. Th- mm-hmm. This seems crazy to me. Yeah. Why would they be so aggressive? Roseanne Boylan, like Ashley Babbitt's just a little person. I know she had some military service. How, do we know how old Roseanne Boylan is? Or? She's in her late 30s. And the first story about Roseanne Boylan, I think, was that she died of a drug overdose. Yes. You know, they tried to smear her that she was on drugs or something. And then it was that she was trampled. And now it's come out, there's video of her being beaten while she's laying on the ground. The, the two other men that died, one was a man named Benjamin Phillips, I believe, who died of a heart attack, just a legitimate heart attack in the midst of all the chaos. And the other one, Kevin Greeson, was actually hit by a flashbang that the Capitol Police had fired into the middle of the crowd from the balcony, and he had a heart attack from being hit by the grenade. So those are the four people that died that day. That's All it. Trump supporters. All Trump supporters. And do, do you feel like, and I know, you know, obviously I certainly have a bias because I'm irate about this, but have they told us anything that's truthful? I mean, one thing about that day this true because I you hear the number 140 police officers injured or taken 
none of that rings true to me. And, and we certainly, people certainly don't seem aware that four people died and they're all Trump supporters, but allegedly this was the worst attack on law enforcement in the history of America. Without weapons. That it's like nobody brought any weapons. If this was going to be an attack, you would think that the Trump supporters, who are probably the most heavily armed people in the country, you know, if this was really some sort of legitimate attack, we would have brought something besides our polygrip and our, you know, our sleep apnea machines or whatever. <laughs> you know, I, I read a story that accuses Colton of using a weapon. And it's it, the story I said, it was some kind of gloves with spikes in them. They were motorcycle gloves that you can buy on Amazon for $20 that his friend bought for him that invited him to go that day. Now, yes, they charged him with assault with a deadly weapon because every time he went to pick up that officer, they charged him with assault with a deadly weapon. Just but if you, if you read underneath the charges on the charging document, the government acknowledges that he never uses the weapon, even though he has ample opportunity to use it, that the officer- The can, weapon is the gloves. Yes, the weapon is the gloves that, that he never uses. Was he wearing the gloves when they picked up the person or when yeah. he helped? Yeah. But it's a motorcycle glove. Yep, yeah. yep. So let's go all the way back to the beginning Colton is a law enforcement official here in Franklin. And so on January 3rd, 4th, 5th, uh, w you guys are having conversations, I would imagine, about should you go? Do you want to go? Maybe you shouldn't go. H how do your bosses feel about it? Are those conversations going? Yeah, so um, it wasn't a very popular thing in our house um, because he was in a car accident where he rolled his truck 12 times nine days prior to this. And so I didn't want him to go simply because I didn't think he was fit to go be in a crowd of a million people to stand all day and knowing he's a cop, constantly watching the crowd, his back up to the wall. I didn't want him to go for that reason. but. In a marriage, you pick and choose your battles, and I believe that anybody has the right to air their grievances to the government. I certainly did not think that what went down that day was how January 6th was going to be to be portrayed. And, you know, he called me after all that happened. He was walking back to his hotel. It was about 5.30 Eastern time he called me when he finally got service. And what he told me on that phone call on January 6th has been his story from January 6th to today. And so what did he tell you on that phone call? He told me that he, a woman died and he was trying to save her life and he was helping the cops. And I said, I, I didn't know you went inside the Capitol. I saw that, that she was shot. And he said, no, I never went into the Capitol, Sarah. There was a woman who was beaten by the cops as she was laying on the ground. Well, none of that came out until about April of that year. And that's when it came out that she had relapsed um, because she was a, a, an addict to Adderall previously, but was sober for seven years. And so it had come out that the toxology report said that she had relapsed and, and overdosed on Adderall. Well, then the story had changed and it was that she was trampled. And now you can sort of, not in mainstream, but there are some outlets that talk about, you know, did Lila Morris murder her by beating her? I, I can't say because they cremated her body. And so you can't ever go back and look at it, get it exhumed and have a, a, some, an outsider look into it. Um, but she certainly didn't do what she is taught to do as a law enforcement officer. And that's to not beat somebody as they're unconscious, lying on the ground, unarmed. Colton, is he a, was he an, is he an over the top, over the top isn't the right word, but how big of a Trump supporter is he or what, I'm talking about previously, long back. Yeah. Um, he loved Trump for what he stood for. Um, he liked Trump before he said that he was going to run, um, but he's very conservative in his views. He, he was born and raised in East Tennessee and very conservative in his thoughts. Um, but he loved that Trump wasn't a politician and treated America as a business, as it is, and was able to turn the country around um, and do good for just average citizens. You know, it wasn't always about the elite and it wasn't between the rich and the poor. It was just 
an, an American. And that's how he looked at people, especially as a law enforcement officer. I mean, I've seen him give money out of his pocket, his shirt off his back to people that actually needed it, that were homeless and just down on their luck. Um, and he didn't grow up with much. He, he grew up in a very dysfunctional, poor family, but he didn't let that define who he was. And that's one of the reasons he went into being a law enforcement officer is because he felt called to help his community. And in 2018, he was in Cherokee County, Georgia, um, is where he served most of his time. And he um, received a life-saving award for saving an inmate's life. And that just is a testament to his character, to who he is, that he will literally give you the shirt off his back. He will do anything. And it didn't matter, you know, what your past was. This was an inmate that was serving their time. It didn't matter. He, he stepped in and saved her life. And so he started his law enforcement career in Georgia? Well, he actually started in East Tennessee. And then we got married and moved to Georgia. And then we came back and that's when he was a Williamson County Sheriff's deputy. How long have you guys been back here in Tennessee? Uh, we moved back to Nashville in 2020. And do you have kids? No. No kid. How long have you been married? Seven years. You know each other in high school? Or? Yeah, we were high school sweethearts. We've been together 14 of those seven years. 14 years, married seven. And so when the law, when he gets back to Nashville, Franklin, let's say on January 7th or 8th, mm -hmm. does he think it's over and that he's done nothing wrong and that, okay, I went to January 6th, let's go on with our life? Or is he, are you guys having conversations about, man, I wonder if they're going to come get me? Or We never had that conversation because we never thought, like, I didn't have the video evidence to prove what he was saying to be true, but I knew what he was telling me was the truth. And even after they came in August and got him, I never thought that I'd be sitting here two years later with him still sitting in jail. Because in the normal court system, when you, when you have an America that upholds their justice system, he would have been released on bond. He would have had a trial in front of his own peers, and he would have been exonerated on all of his charges. Yet he still sits awaiting trial in Washington, D.C., and his trial will be in Washington, D.C. at a 99.4 conviction rate. And the reason he wants to take this to trial instead of pleading out for his immediate freedom is, one, he did nothing wrong that day, and he has the evidence to prove it. But two, he it's not only about him. He wants justice for Roseanne Boylan because at some point he will come home whether it's two years or 20 years from now. But Roseanne Boylan will never go back to her family because her life was taken that day. You said something that he could plead out and come home today, you believe? He wouldn't come home today. He could plead out. They offered him a plea deal of nine years, seven to nine years. And he's already served two of that. Um, and he could get into programs that would get him home sooner. But he doesn't want his immediate freedom for that. Is it tempting? Absolutely. He wants to move on with his life and be able to have a family at some point. And but he knows that this is bigger than him. So many of these people, Jason, I mean, it, it, by and large, these are good Christian people. These are people that are in law enforcement, veterans, people who love this country, who have never been arrested for anything before in their lives. And they are treating them like this because they're on the wrong side of the political spectrum for the people in Washington. They are punishing these people deliberately because they are faithful, patriotic Americans. Seven to nine years is, blows my mind. But when did you receive some, before they came in August, did you receive some letter saying, hey, you're under investigation, you're a or they show up in August and you're like, what are they doing here? They, uh, we didn't have the pleasure of the battering rams at our house or coming on a pre-dawn raid. They took him at work. Um, I had tried to get a hold of him that morning. I was not home. I was traveling on the West Coast for work. And I tried to get a hold of him that morning and he wasn't answering his phone. And I had called my mom, have you talked to him? And she said, no, I talked to him when he was on his way home from work yesterday and that was it. And I was like, okay, well, I'll let it go to lunchtime before I like start to get worried. And um, actually, the second time that I had called him back, I called him once and then I called him again immediately and my call was forwarded. So I really didn't know what was going on. But later I did find out from him that the FBI forwarded my call because they had his phone. And he looked at them and said, if you don't tell her what's going on, like, you don't know the wrath of Sarah, what's about to happen? <laughs> and so um, shortly after that, about an hour later, the FBI called me and I didn't answer it because it was an unknown number and I was away for a work trip. 
Um, they called me back immediately, and so I answered it, and they said, is this Sarah Mackby? I said, it is, and they said, this is so-and-so with the FBI. We just apprehended your husband, and we are pulling into your driveway to raid your house. And I said, okay, and it was kind of a blur. I mean, I was on the phone with him for about 10 minutes. I just, I, I had heard horror stories of January 6th, and so I just ple pleaded with them, please don't touch my dogs, because I have heard that they have shot and killed animals. Um, and my dogs were in crates, and I was like, please. And so I have about an hour and a half of them raiding our house on camera before they covered the cameras up. Um, I told them that nobody was in the house, and they, of course, did their raid, and um, they even took a gun to our pantry. Like, you know it's a pantry, and, and they're, like, ready for something to jump out of them. It's such a, going back and watching that stuff, it's just so, um, it's unethical. It's very, um, it seems like a clown show to me, to be honest with you. Guys, I want to talk to you about Samaritan Ministries. Tired of someone else telling you where to go when you have a medical need? Are you ready to take control of your health care? Samaritan Ministries could be the solution you're looking for. They connect hundreds of thousands of Christians across the nation who come together through prayer, encouragement, and financial support when a medical need arises. It's not insurance, and you're not limited by restrictive networks. Say you have a medical need. You don't need to check and see what hospital is in your network or be concerned about the doctor being in network too. No, you go to the hospital, you choose, and don't give a second thought as to what's in network and what's not because with Samaritan Ministries, you're in control of your health care. Afterwards, fellow members pray for you and send money directly to you to help you pay your medical bills. And when they have a medical need, you'll do the same for them. That's what biblical health care sharing looks like. Check it out today at SamaritanMinistries.org slash fearless. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash fearless. What would be the point, though, so a crime allegedly occurred in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. What could they find at your house <laughs> that was going to contribute to that case? They took 14 items, including the stuff that he was wearing that day. Um, but I think the most interesting thing that they took of those 14 items was they took our front porch flag. They, they take they, a lot of these cases, they say they photograph all the Trump paraphernalia like it's contraband. Yeah. It's like this proves what a criminal you are because you have this Trump stuff, you know, and they like one instance, they, they, this guy had a bunch of pocket constitutions that he carried around to give out to people. They photographed that like that's some sort of a, you know, drug that he's handing out that's Ill illegal, you know. So they are demonizing these people. They, they do these things to spread fear. Part of the reason they're treating these people this way is they want to scare everybody else into shutting up, into not defending these people. I mean, we were talking earlier, I tried to contact the people that Colton worked with at the Williamson County Sheriff's Department. Nobody would speak to me about him. I tried to contact the people in Cherokee County where he worked before. Nobody there would talk to me about, just, just like, you know, was Colton a nice guy? Nobody would even talk to me. And that's part of why they're doing this, is to make everybody afraid. Roseanne Boylan's family will not say a word. The boyfriend that went with her, I've tried to contact him. He won't speak about it because they're all afraid. Either they have been directly told, we're going to come after you if you don't shut up, or they're just seeing what's going on, and they're going, I don't want any part of that. That, that is... Very commonplace. I, Sarah, I think either Nick or you told me last week that have, have some people involved in this case have already taken plea deals? Yeah, so he was one of nine. Um, and they usually group people that know each other, but he didn't know any of these guys until he went to D.C. and then met a couple of them that were being detained. Um, but he was one of nine. He was number seven on the indictment. Um, one of the gentlemen passed away who wasn't incarcerated, just died of natural causes while awaiting trial. Every, every other person has pled out. He is the only one that has been willing to take this to trial. What kind of plea deals did they strike? Um, they, they've gotten anywhere from five to seven years. And, you know, there were what they don't want to look at at the Lower West Terrace Tunnel is they only want to talk about the violence that had happened once that officer was on the ground. They don't want to talk about what happened 10 minutes before, where they were spraying gas in the tunnel, where they were raging war on American citizens, where a lot of these individuals that are charged with violent charges 
were protecting people. There were a lot of violence against women, as you had spoke about, um, and against the elderly. And so any person, any man that doesn't step in between and say, I will take this charge, whatever it might be, but you are not going to be beating on innocent people that are that are absolutely helpless. Nick mentioned Victoria White. Her hands were literally pinned down to her side, and the officer struck her 40 times. I mean, she was completely bloodied. They punched her in the face. And somebody that was convicted on all those charges that is still awaiting sentencing in D.C. attacked that officer because he was protecting Victoria White. Because that officer, and, and he had been attacked himself. And so he was attacked three different times before he actually took action against them. But now he's the one that has been convicted. And so that's what they've done with these people. They are putting these violent assault charges on them for, well, in my husband's case, for not even assaulting them, but for stepping in between them beating women. And you asked earlier, why would they beat the women? That's part of it is to instigate it because if you get a bunch of sheepdogs up there, like most of the people that went, these are Christian men, a lot of them veterans, a lot of them police officers, you see a woman being beaten, you're going to step in. And that's part of the strategy. It, it, the first thing that ran through my mind, I connected it to Daniel Penny and, you know, on the subway mm -hmm. and how they are, they are emasculating men and sending a clear message to men. Don't you be men. Don't you step in and stop anything from going on. And, and yes, a, you would be... If I was there, I'm put in an impossible position. Yeah. Right. I sit there, oh, you're going to shoot and kill Ashley Babbitt, but I'm not going to do anything about it. You're going to beat this woman. I'm not going to do anything about it. Of course, as a, as a Christian man, I was like, well, yeah. I'm, this is a make or break. God's either going to hate me or he's going to love me because I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I have conducted a hundred interviews, at least, in, in all this, talked to all these people who were there. And one thing that always hits me, I happened to be on the other side of the building where there was not this kind of thing going on. It was a much different atmosphere on the other side. People singing songs, waving flags and up on the stairs. But like I didn't even know any violence had occurred until I got home that night. And I always ask myself, it occurs to me while I'm talking to these people, if I had been on the other side, I probably would have done exactly what they had done. And I would be in the same boat as them. I, I listened to a Twitter Spaces last week or the week before after um, Tar Enrique Tario. The, mm -hmm. uh, I listened. He, he was talking from jail over this Twitter Spaces, and and it, it and then someone from jail came on that's in jail and sang the national anthem. And then they they we prayed on the call. Someone from jail, mm -hmm. and so is is I'm, he's is your husband at the same jail as probably Tario and these other guys? And it, yeah, they're held in Washington D.C. Um, inside D.C., it's the correctional treatment facility, and they're in their own pod. Um, we call it the Patriot Pod. And every night at nine p.m., they sing the national anthem. And so there. That's been about the only thing that's given me a tiny bit of hope is that like they're in an environment where they're centering God and their faith, they're centering their patriotism. And so it's like if they can survive this coming out on the other side, I think these are going to be some of our great leaders, uh, some people that have been put to the test and we know we can trust them. Uh, they won't be double agents. Uh, but what, what your husband taking it to trial and not backing down, he's risking, I would imagine a major sentence. They will try, they'll do him like they did, uh, Enrique Tario, I would imagine. They're going to throw the book at him. And we were, as a family, we are prepared for that, um, because we know that this is bigger than ourselves. Um, and we are called as Christians to be selfless people. And God never said that we weren't going to be persecuted as Christians. And so, as you said, how are these people doing it? I, I don't know how they still sing the anthem every night. I mean, we're going on almost a thousand days. In two weeks, it'll be a thousand days since January 6th. And I don't know. I say all the time, I don't know how they do it. But I, I believe it's only by the grace of God 
that they know that this isn't going to last forever, that they will stand up on the right side of history. And as you said, they've already talked about running for different offices, even on a local level. And there are people in there right now that are doing things. There are several organizations that are being run literally from inside a jail cell with help on the outside. That's where our foundation came from. Um, there's a, a man on the inside that is literally running it from his jail cell while we're just out here doing the work because they know that this is bigger than themselves. It's bigger than January 6th. This justice system is broken as a whole. Talk about Stand in the Gap Foundation and what you guys are doing. Yeah, so at Stand in the Gap, there's three things that we do. Family services, reentry, and justice reform. And the immediate need is in family services. So for two years, they weren't allowed to see their loved ones even via video um, because of COVID is what they had said. And so after Troy Nels went into the facility and granted them in-person in -person visitation, they were happy for about two hours. And then they realized they cannot even afford for their families to fly from wherever in the country to go see them for an hour or two hours on a Friday. And so we launched Operation Love Wins where the general public could help fund um, their families. And so we've been able to fund over 25 families to go see their loved ones for visitation. And now um, we have launched that for nationwide for any January 6th defendant, because we believe it's so important for the fathers to stay involved in their children's lives and, and spouses to be able to reconnect and, and parents able to see their kids. And so um, we've launched that across the nation for, for families. And then the second most important thing is appellant attorneys. As I said, there's a 99.4 conviction rate in the district um, circuit right now. And so we need to take it to the circuit court. But what we found is two and a half years later, people are financially broken from the government because in a normal case, you go get the best attorney to represent you. And that's why a lot of these people, even if they do commit a crime, they get away with it, right? Because there's holes and, and these attorneys know what they're doing. Well, it doesn't matter how much you pay for a January 6th attorney, they're not getting anywhere. And so now that their cases have been resolved in the fact of trial and sentencing, now they're financially broke that they're just gonna have to sit there and serve their sentence because they simply cannot afford an appellant attorney. And Sarah was advised <laughs> Yes. by her attorney, don't spend your money now. Just take the, the court appointed uh, you know, public defender because there's no chance. Yeah. The DC judges, the DC juries, there's no chance for you to be acquitted no matter what the evidence says. They're gonna say you're guilty no matter what, save your money for the appeal. I would, <clears throat> the, the importance of the upcoming election and potential pardons, that's, probably the hope or the rave hope at the end of this deal uh, accurate? Yeah, no, the guys that are still being held in DC, they are literally counting down the months to the election because you know, it's interesting. I've never heard a January 6th defendant ask for a pardon. They just want their day in court and a jury of their peers because they know that they would be exonerated on their charges. But, and now it's not only about the pardons, they want true investigations into January 6th. They want investigations into the four deaths. They want investigations into the officers that waged war on them that day. They want investigations into Nancy Pelosi and Yogananda Pittman and all these people that set them up because they don't want this to ever happen to their American, their fellow Americans, even 50 years from now when January 6th is not talked about anymore. They don't want that to ever be able to happen again. And I've done more investigating than, than the, the government has into the real truth of January 6th, and I'm just some dumbass actor. You know, it's like they haven't done anything except spread their narrative and, and lie and push, push the facts that, or not even the facts, push the story that they want out there. Sarah, on this show, I'm, I'm very transparent about my faith walk as a kid, raised in the church, good foundation. Then I went off into the world and had success and got caught up in a bunch of other stuff and was an idiot for a long time. And, and have, you know, things have gone so haywire in this uh, country that the importance of my faith has been centered and like, holy cow, what, you know, what was I think? So I, I want you to talk honestly about your faith journey because obviously you and your husband are only surviving through faith. What, was it always this important or has this situation had the same impact on you that it's kind of had on me 
that over the last five, six years, now you got drag queens at schools and all this other stuff. I'm like, holy cow, let me get as close to God as I possibly can, because yeah. this is crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, no, our faith walk, I mean, he grew up in a church, I grew up in a church, um, and our lives have always been centered around God, but it's literally clinging to your faith, being so, and I've seen, and I'm sure Nick has seen, the families that have weathered this storm, it's because they are so rooted in their faith that they know that this is bigger than them, and as I said, it's it's very much a God thing. You know, you, you ask yourself, why my husband? Why me? You know, I believe that these individuals that have been affected by January 6th were chosen for such a time as this. And I just pray, you know, somebody asked me earlier, what does your nightly prayer look like? And sometimes it's ugly. Sometimes I'm really mad at God. Even two years later, I don't understand. I need a, you know, a sign. I need something to be able to continue on this. Sometimes it's praying through tears because you just never know what the day looks like. Sometimes it's praising God in the car. I call my my car my sanctuary on wheels, you know, because that's my alone time with God where it's just, you just have to have, and it's not like you hear this voice where it's like, things are going to be fine in 14 months, you know, when we get Trump back. And that's not, that's not what it looks like. It's a very real thing that I wake up every day and I'm like, Lord, give me the strength to get through today because I don't need to know what tomorrow looks like. I don't need to know what the next election looks like. I just need the strength to continue to fight this battle. And I pray every night that Americans will rise up to the occasion. I think a lot of them have been lulled to sleep and they're not bad people because of it, but they need to know that if they're coming after average citizens like we were, we just live this little American life. And if they're gonna come after us and persecute us because we're going against their narrative, then it could happen to anybody. It could happen to school moms. It could happen, you know, people need to find what they're passionate about. It doesn't have to be necessarily be January 6th, whether it's COVID or the border or whatever it is, but Americans need to rise up and, and the representatives in Washington, D.C. need to be reminded that they work for us. I mean, I, just speaking of, of the representatives in Tennessee, you know, I, I want to know why Marsha Blackburn hasn't hasn't done anything for her 27 constituents that have been affected by January 6th. We had Scott um, Desjardins was our congressional member in the House and when he was taken and it took me getting um, a hold of somebody in Trump's administration to get me a meeting with him because he wouldn't even say anything to us. And then they just tell you everything you want to hear. I testified in front of Congress on June 13th and I told them about USC, uh, excuse me, 18 USC section four, where it talks about if you know of a felony that was committed, you're obligated to report it and investigate it. And so it's on record about the four deaths that day and how these men are being treated and nothing is being done. How you mentioned that you travel for work. Have you been able to continue with your career? Um, so I worked two full-time jobs for a very long time after this had happened. And um, just recently I sold my house and I decided that I was gonna jump all in and I was gonna do this. So now I run the foundation full-time. You did, are, have you, you still live here obviously? Yes. And how often have you been able to go to D.C. and visit Colton? Um, I've seen him three times in the last two years. For how long each time? Um, an hour. It's heartbreaking. And it's deliberate. You know, I mean, I've met so many of these people, Jason, and their faith, and it, it, it's, it's inspiring to see them strong enough to, to get through this pain. And it's, it's all, it's, it's, it's sharpened my faith just to, to ex experience people like Sarah and Colton and Derek Kennison and, you know, uh, all the people that I've met. J.D. Rivera, you know, I mean, these people are the salt of the earth. These are great, great people. And they're being persecuted because of that. There are people that commit murders to get more than an hour with their loved one. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, they went two years without even laying eyes on their loved ones. And that's, like, like Nick said, it's deliberate. It's to break them spiritually, emotionally, financially, you know, and if they can't break them in those arenas, they break them physically. And there has been multiple cases of abuse against January 6th defendants, simply because they are awaiting trial, being persecuted on their beliefs. And it's so 
distressing to see these politicians talk about every issue except this. It's like they look at January 6th and they're, it's a transactional position. They look at the January 6th and, and they say, does this help me or hurt me? Is this going to make me more popular in my district? or less popular. And so they're afraid of the issue. And it's like you said before, I would like to see every one of these presidential candidates on the Republican side come out and say, the first thing I'm gonna do is pardon these people from January 6th. It, it has to happen because this, this is the real crime against this country. Not what happened on January 6th, but the way the people that went there are being treated by our government. Hasn't the vague has he been on the record here saying about pardoning people? Vivek Ramaswamy. I have not. I'm not. I don't know. I don't know. What what Trump has been a tiny bit evasive about what he's going to do. Am I accurate or no? Just recently, he it was at an event in D.C. I think it was this past week where he had said um, that he is going to assign a task force to look at every January 6th case. As far as I'm aware, he is the only one that has promised people pardons in, in the fact of it doesn't have to be violent versus nonviolent. If you went into the Capitol or misdemeanors, he's not put um, conditions on the pardon. Now, I don't think a blanket pardon will work because I do believe bad things that happened that day. And those people need to be held accountable that haven't yet. But I think it needs to be looked at as a whole. And I know DeSantis he was his feet was held to the fire and he said, well, I'll look at it. But it's I don't know of a candidate that has said what he has said in regards to the January 6th defendants. So in your view, Trump is our best hope. Trump's the only way in my in my opinion. Nick, tell me a little bit more about capital punishment, too, or what, what we can expect. Well, in a lot of these cases, we've, we've followed people as they've gone to jail. We've met their families. We've talked to, to uh, lawyers who represented them, and we've talked to Julie Kelly, journalists. We, basically, we are exploring what the Department of Justice is doing now. Uh, the capital punishment one was more about the FBI, what the FBI, the law enforcement wing is doing. Capital punishment two is about what the judicial system is doing, how they are changing the way these trials are being conducted simply to punish these people more. And it's also about the setup. We've, we've talked to Tariq Johnson, a Capitol Police officer, who says that he- Black guy, he yeah. was on that Twitter spaces mm -hmm. uh, that, that I listened to. And, and, you know, there's, and I'm sorry for cutting you off, but there's a, a story about one of these, uh, and I've been waiting for it to come out, but one of these officers that was on TV, Big, tall, light-skinned black dude, I think, that was Harry yeah, Dunn. claiming all these things happen. And, and what I've been told is they're going to release the videotape at, at some point, and it's all a lie. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's all a lie. And all the things he said on TV did not happen. And, and when I heard him say it at the time, I was like, stop lying, man. That, yeah. that ain't, that's not how... Well, all the usual police officers at the January 6th committee paraded out there and talked about how horribly they were treated. They're the same ones. They say the same things over and over again, and it's all a lie. None of it happened. And if it had happened, they'd have the videotape to prove it. They don't have it. They have 400,000 hours of footage on that day. If, if what Harry Dunn said happened to him actually happened, it would be on tape. But you haven't seen it because it's not there. Any, any, who's been, I know Julie Kelly's been good in the media. Have there been any others in the media that are, are strong on this? Tucker did a little bit on Fox News. And Darren I, Beatty, Darren Beatty of Revolver News has been very good about it. John Solomon as well. He was given access to the videos. He's been exposing a lot of stuff. Anybody in corporate media, anybody, they just, it's a no-go zone for everybody? No. Uh, well, that Scott McFarlane. Mm -hmm. uh, CBS News. Yeah, he, he, he kind of off the record, didn't he? It was to you, right? He said something. Not to me. It was to um, Ashley Babbitt's mom. I was with her in, in Washington, D.C. We work closely with her foundation called For Ashley. And I was in D.C. with her. We were doing congressional meetings, and we ran over to the courthouse in between some meetings to hear um, how some of the cases were going. And she had walked outside and Scott McFarlane, he's one of them that covers every case. 
And he had said off the record to her, he had asked who, who she was with. And she said, Sarah McAfee, Ronald McAfee's um, wife. And he said, you know, we, you and I disagree about a lot of things, but one thing we can question is why her husband is still in jail. But he would never say that on the air. No. You know, that's the thing. If he says that on the air, they're going to yank him off. The media is, is stay, you know, they're run by fear just like everybody else. Nick, I know, and Sarah, are you on social media at all, Sarah? I am, yeah. It, it does seem like, and this is a small thing, but it's not really a small thing. It does seem like things have improved over Twitter in terms of what we're allowed to say since Elon Musk has taken over. Is that is that accurate? Well, we were talking about it before. It's like, yeah, in some ways, I can say whatever I want, but nobody sees it. I'm still shadow banned. I'm still like, and, and Sarah's had her, her uh, foundation account suspended by Twitter with no explanation. Really? No. I mean, it, it, they, it was good for a while, but I think Elon hired, made some bad hires again, and now they're back to, you know, they're back to suppressing people that they don't want, they don't want their thoughts to get out. Yeah, I, I'll be interested to see how, to be quite frankly, how YouTube treats this interview. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh yeah, uh, I, 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 this issue from day one, and and I can remember, on January six, I told I was talking to a friend, and and my friend was very naive, and he thought, like everybody's going to get a slap on the wrist, and I said on January six, I said, are you kidding me? What they're about to do to these people? is going to be unbelievable, and it's actually worse than what I thought. I, I, I thought by now it would be over. I knew it would be bad. I knew they were gonna throw the book at a handful of people, but they've gone after everybody mm -hmm. and have shut up people and scared people to death and-, and Caused suicides. Yes. Four, four people have committed suicide because of the charges. And the other, not to cut you off, Jason, no, but the other thing is- I, I, my nose is running. I'm crying. I look like an idiot. <laughs> well, they're not stopping. I mean, a friend of mine in California two months ago, he thought, you know, they came and uh, questioned him two years ago, and he thought, well, I guess it's over. Two months ago, they arrested him, charged him with the same felonies everybody else. He's looking at 20 years. This is a colleague of mine. I can't even say his name on the air because he's afraid, you know, it might affect his case. But fellow actor, guy I know. I mean, it, they are not stopping. They are going to continue to do this. They're going to run it all the way through the 24 election. They've got to keep this insurrection, domestic terrorism thing going, and they're not going to stop. Well, thank you guys uh, for taking the time. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to keep you in my prayers. Uh, this is, I, I can't believe I'm living through this. This is sad. I, I just, can't believe it. Yeah. I, I, well, I want to plug one thing, too. There's another yeah. movie coming out October 23rd called Police State that Dinesh D'Souza made. Oh, yeah, you're participating in I'm that. In, I'm in that, too. I, you're I'm, just plugging your movies, Nick. Yeah, I'm plugging Very self yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but I play the big, bad FBI guy in that, and it's something I'm... So it, that's a movie. It's not a documentary. No, it's both. They have reenactments, gotcha. but like, and Dinesh has always had some reenactments in his documentaries, but he hasn't had any real professional actors in them like me. So this one's going to be a lot better. Sarah, I'm going to lighten the, I'm glad we're in it on a lighter note. Did, did you ever see Nick in Justified in the original? Yes, yes. Justified. Don't watch the new one. It's very woke. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm not in it. So what's right. the point? Right, exactly. <laughs> it was one of my, I love, I love that show. Yeah. Uh, anyway, thank you guys both. Thank you. Uh, standinthegap.foundation. That's where you can go if you want to support. Yeah. I'm going to do that right now. I want to inspire uh, you guys here in the Fearless Army uh, to go to the website and uh, let's donate and let's contribute to these guys. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you next week.
association, my system, no relation We all just wanna have freedom Sitting on a corner, never been alone I'll break my back for freedom Bless, we are living, get back We are receiving, all receiving We all wanna be free